always been interested in the railways, but not much of history in locally or nationally. But in 2013, while I was on sabbatical in England, I was intrigued by a series of TV programs by Michael Portillo. Michael Portillo was a former cabinet member in the British government. And what he was doing was looking, with the aid of a book, to see what the differences were between the days of the Victorian era and currently. So his 1840 book, A Railway Guide, was used as he travelled around and found interesting things in the British Isles that compared the two periods from the Victorian era to the current day. This is the book, this is Bradshaw's Handbook, or uh, Bradshaw's Descriptive Railway Handbook of Great Britain and Ireland. It contains vast amounts of information of the whole country, details right down to little villages, in fact the little village that I was born in, and contains some pictures as well. So it really is a, an, an encyclopedic document to cover the whole of the British Isles and the railway systems and associated interesting facts and places to visit if you travelled along those railway systems. Well, this approach has stirred me into looking into the situation here in southeast Connecticut. Not just the, the current situation of transportation that have developed from steam trains to electric trains, but also to look at the history that have gone from the trolleys to the current situation and to look at transportation in general with respect to things like the bridges across the rivers and how we've had to develop from one form of, of regular trains to our current high speed trains and the factors that are affecting those running. Like Michael, I've relied on books and documents and pieces of information that have been given to me by local people here and the librarians who have been very good in supporting me in this project. So I'm looking at not just the current situation but clearly very much the history of what's gone on here in southern eastern Connecticut. So these following short videos have been fascinating for me to develop and I've become very interested in this area, history again, that I've never been interested in before. So I hope they're of interest to you and obviously uh, I, I put a lot of effort into that and I still enjoy doing them and I'll continue to do so. I am on the southbound platform at Westerly Station in Rhode Island. This is the entry for Amtrak trains coming into Connecticut. I'm interested in the rails between here and New London, 26 miles away, and plan to show you not only the stations and bridges, but to introduce some of the transportation history in this area of southeastern Connecticut that began with the building of this section of the American Railroads in 1832. As part of the Northeast Corridor, Westerly Station opened along with the New York Providence and Boston Railroad on November the 17th in 1837. The original depot was a small wooden structure similar to several of those still surviving in nearby West Mystic and Noank in Connecticut that we will visit shortly. Between 1906 and 1922, the depot served the Norwich and Westerly Railway interurban trolley system, which did not run along the coast route that we will follow, but went inland via North Stonington to the town of Norwich. This was built to high-speed interurban standards on 21 miles of mostly private rights of way, and with relatively few at-grade crossings. It carried some freight, including coal, and had a successful passenger business with eight cars. The closest remaining track route is in North Stonington, where a concrete bridge remains in place over the Asaconk Brook.
the line had only one major accident in 1907 when a passenger car and freight motor collided in North Stonington. However, due to rapidly declining ridership, service on this line ended on December the 31st, 1922. Between 1912 and 1913, a new westerly station was constructed, part of the New York, Hartford and New Haven line. It was part of a curve straightening project and the new station included stone buildings in a Spanish colonial revival style. Along with the main station building itself, there were arcaded structures at both north and south ends. A new pedestrian tunnel was constructed from the northbound shelter to enable passengers to reach the southbound shelter on the opposite platform. Although a full service facility for many years, Westerly Station does not now provide a waiting room or ticketing facility which you can see existed in these 1996 photographs. In addition to passenger rails, there is an area of truncated freight lines that served as a commercial access to local business buildings. Currently they provide a resting place for discarded rail trucks and an array of modern maintenance vehicles that have access to the main rail lines. Train approaching. Please remain behind yellow line. Westerly Station is served exclusively by the Amtrak service, a national passenger system. Here in the northeast it's comprised of the Acela high-speed trains, none of which stop in Westerly. And a northeastern regional service that has some non-stopping trains Others stop and allow passengers to alight and board the trains on a few occasions each day. Leaving Westerly Station, we will be travelling south in our regional train over a couple of railroad bridges. Leaving Westerly, we enter Connecticut in Porkatuck. Trolley transportation began in 1894 when the Porkatuck Valley Street Railway began operation and continued until the 1920s. A wood-fired steam railroad, trains pulled by engines such as this, was a major factor in the development of Porkatuck as a separate industrial community. The Mechanic Street Historic District contains seven interconnected industrial buildings constructed between 1855 and 1920, as well as a large concentration of houses dating from about 1830 to 1920.
A railroad line runs through the Mechanics Street district, cutting off access to many of the smaller streets. such as Cedar Street and providing the only at-grade crossing at Palmer Street. Interesting structures in the district include at the south end the granite abutments for an elevated spur line. An enlightening 1934 aerial photograph shows the location of the elevated bridge relative to the Pawcatuck River and the main rail line. The earthworks to raise rail traffic from the riverfront to the bridge are still extant. As is the location of the point at which the spur line joined the main line. Currently it is a work site, but it's clearly adjacent to the existing tracks. The railroad bridge has been removed and close by are the floodgates to protect the mill complex from river flooding. Today, Pawcatuck is only a throughway for the northeast regional trains that run through the Mechanic Street Historic District. Though still closely associated with Westerly, Pawcatuck lies within the modern day boundaries of Stonington in Connecticut. This next section of our railway story starts in Pawcatuck, which is the northern section of Stonington. And we're going to work our way all the way through the borough of Stonington until we reach the east side of the river in Mystic. The start of the five mile rail journey from Pawcatuck is in a southwest direction down to Stonington. As the trains leave Pawcatuck, the journey is mostly across the Barn Island Wildlife Management Area. It is the largest coastal wildlife management area in the state, and the habitat is dominated by 540 acres of deciduous forest and 290 acres of tidal marshes but there is also significant areas of open salt water. The rail line has to pass under the access road to the wildlife area. And then along the coastline. This latter coastline rail section divides residential areas from the bay and creates a number of examples of at-grade crossings. One of these is for access to Eliu Island. Eliu Island is a favourite wedding location and is approached by a long causeway. Hence the need for a railway road crossing. And then we'll find that a hundred yards further towards Stonington 
is another crossing to Walker's Dock. I am reminded through this book by Turner and Jacobus that the New York Providence and Boston Railroad Company, known locally as the Stonington Railroad, was the first line to open on Connecticut soil, and this provided carriage from Providence into Stonington Village in 1832. Not only was this the beginning of transport to New York by rail, but also was the terminus for steamers on the Stonington Line travelling to New York, a service having a grand opening in 1837 at the Wadawanuk Hotel, now on the spot occupied by the Stonington Library. Both the trains and the new steamer Narragansett continued to burn wood at this time, Narragansett weighed 576 tons and was 212 feet long. But by 1859 the first coal-burning locomotives were running, including the new arrival, the Matthew Morgan. Stonington became a hub for people travelling between New York and Boston, though the first obstacle to through rail traffic was Stonington Harbour, from where they had to take a ferry. The train from Westerly entering Stonington Borough from the east travelled along Denison Avenue, squeezed between homes and businesses to the end of the line at New York Steamboat Pier and Depot. This passage was not a long-term solution, so tracks were laid to bypass the wharf to the north and provide a continuous railroad to the west. Meanwhile, shunting lines were added to allow engines to be reversed but the noise created by these activities was not appreciated by the locals. A small station depot was located at the entrance area to the wharf, which is now recognised and named Matthews Park. Extant evidence shows where the original tracks were diverted at the yellow circle with a new direction along the red arrow rather than along the green arrow toward the town centre. Denison Avenue was closed. The original tracks passed the Congregational Church, now indicated by a plaque acknowledging Connecticut's first railroad. The railroad's builder was George Washington Whistler. Whistler's burial plot is to be found in the Evergreen Cemetery and his son was the painter of the portrait known as Whistler's mother. The change in direction to avoid the ferry crossing and the advent of greater passenger traffic led to further changes in the borough. As we saw, the through trains took a new path towards the northwest leaving tangled growth in its removal. Around the corner the tracks approach Elm Street, which in the past was a local road with gated access crossing. Now it is permanently closed with less than attractive surroundings. But interestingly, this corner of Elm Street and Cutler Street still has an existing building that was a main stopping point for the local trolley line. Towards the wharf area, another road has been closed, Water Street, with untidy barriers that have recently been replaced by what is now standard nicer railroad fencing. In conjunction with these street closings, Alpha Avenue, which is Route 1A, was built with a significant road bridge to allow all trains to pass through this end of Stonington safely with less disruptions.
The history of the tracks and changes of direction tend to include the presence of a station in Stonington. An early station near the wharf was burned down in 1897. It appears that other better buildings were later constructed. One of the newer stations, often referred to as depots, looked like this and was dismantled in 1949. It appears that the shelters and platforms were all raised in 1973. Our story now takes us beyond the borough, over a couple of more recent water bridges that have been restructured to allow larger boats to pass under, while maintaining the track level. Another at-grade crossing is here. With a regional train travelling south. Some more of this section of rail is close to the coast. With the track moving slightly inland to pass through Latimer Point. Finally, we see the water tower that indicates that we're almost at Mystic Station. <laughs> 